my name is Mary Jo Rapini, and I'm a licensed therapist. And I, prior to this episode, this incident, what I'm calling now a blessing in my life, I was very removed, detached from an organized religion or feeling close to God. In fact, I felt quite estranged from him. And some of the context of that was I was a psychologist and my husband and I had moved to Lubbock, Texas, where it was a better job for him. And prior to going to Lubbock, I was in Houston, Texas, and I loved it there. And I I was trained as a psychotherapist. I did general marriage and family. And then I went on for additional training to become a sex therapist. So when I was moving to Lubbock, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh my God, you're going to, you know, you're going to be great because you won't have to worry about job. There's very few sex therapists there. And I got the idea that, you know, wow, this is going to be great for my career too. But then when I got there, I realized that the reason there weren't a lot of sex therapists there was because it's quite a conservative area. And it's very difficult to get established with a medical community there as a sex therapist at the time that I was there. So to just give you backstory, what my job was, I was the head of a psycho-oncology unit at Texas Tech and University Medical Center. And basically the reason I say I'm head is because I was the only one that was doing that. And I got into cancer quite backwards, whereas a oncologist hired me to run support groups for his cancer patients. Because many times when you have cancer, you also have intimacy issues with your family and also with your body, you're estranged from it. You go through treatments and you don't feel like the same woman or man many times. So he brought me through a back door and I began running these groups and I found my niche, if you will, with cancer patients. So I was working with them and I worked in a pediatric floor as well. And I saw a lot of terrible things, kids getting cancer, you know, painful treatments and struggling. And it just started deteriorating how I felt about a God, a loving God, especially. So now on to my story, I'm carrying that in my heart at the time of the story. I was going to Gold's Gym. It was a Saturday morning, the 19th of April, which we call in, you know, I was raised as Roman Catholic. It was Holy Saturday. And the next day was Easter. And I was having a big brunch at my house. So I had a lot of things on my mind. I went to the gym and I was working out. And one of the machines I was working out on was when you, when you push, like I was building my body and I had this idea, you know, I can lift twice my body weight with my legs. I should be able to do that with my arms. So I had been really dedicated to working on my chest and my arms. And with one of the machines, you sit in a chair and then you push. And I was loading up on weights that day. So when I pushed the first time, I went, oh my God, like that's really heavy. And, you know, I don't know if I can do another one. I had 98 pounds on it and I weigh 107. So I thought, I'm just going to do one more. And I did one more. And as I pushed, I felt a sharp jabbing pain in the back of my neck. It felt like I had been stabbed or something. So I got up and I was, I was a little bit disoriented because the pain was so intense. I got off the machine. I kind of stumbled to the side. I was thinking, what was that? Because in my back history, I was a nurse prior to becoming a psychologist. And I started going through my whole nervous system, like something in my neck, something in my cerebral fluid, something in my spine, something's not right. I can't walk well. I walked over to the bubbler. And when I pushed down on the lever to get a get water, all of a sudden, this whole right side started jerking, like convulsing, and I had no control. And I was profusely sweating, and my neck hurt so bad that I thought, man, I've done something terrible, like I'm really sick. And I had been just recently diagnosed and treated for high blood pressure, and I had taken that pill that morning. So I kept thinking maybe it was something, you know, associated with that. 
anyway, I laid down and the person, one of the people working out who knew me there said, hey, muscle woman, what's the matter? And I said, if you can go get help, because I, I think I need an ambulance. I hurt myself. And so he was really scared because my face was white. And obviously I'm laying down on the gym floor. So we went to the front and this owner or woman watching the gym that morning came back and she started talking to me and just soothing me and called an ambulance and called my family. And it was just lucky that my husband was in town for Easter weekend because he had taken a job at MD Anderson. This was toward the end of our eight year time in Lubbock when this happened. In fact, we were getting prepared to move back to Houston, which I was very excited about. And I used to joke about it, that I got to get out of Lubbock before this town ends up killing me because everybody I had worked with eventually had succumbed to cancer or was very sick. So anyway, the ambulance took me to the hospital and there it was, you know, they did CAT scans, they did MRIs and they found out that I had had a bleed and there was so much blood in my head that they didn't know if I would survive the night. It so happened that all the neurosurgeons in Lubbock, and I think there's like four of them, that weekend had gone to a conference in Santa Fe. So the only one who was in town was this retired one, and he was a friend of my husband's. So he spoke with Ron and he said, you know, her head is full of blood and they had tried to do an angiogram, but there was so much blood. And the only person that could do it was a pediatric neurologist who also read these angiograms. He said there was so much blood, he couldn't see where it was coming from. So their option was we can kind of stabilize her and just keep an eye on her, but she could die within 24 hours or we could fly her to Dallas. There were specialists there who would take me on. And my husband and I had a pact that if one of us were in the event, one of us had a catastrophic illness or something, that we would not leave each other. I, I watched a lot of people die alone and it's terrible. And I got this sense that when you are dying, you should have another human who loved you or can love you until God takes your hand, they've got your hands and they're holding them. So my husband was told he couldn't go in the jet with me, that it would have been too much weight or the weight would have been off and to pressurize the cabin, they just wouldn't take that risk with him there. So he decided, and we, cause I was in and out of consciousness. I was able to talk to him. I was extremely relaxed. And I keep going back to the reason I was so relaxed because I'm not a relaxed person. I'm very hyper, very anxious in my real life. Well, I used to be in the ambulance. I don't know if you've ever had the kind of pain that it can make you go mad. Like it can drive you crazy. It hurts so bad and going over every bump. I told God, I can't handle this. I need your help and I don't care if I live, I've had a good life. And if it's your will that I be gone, then I want you to know I'm grateful. And I said that at a time, I, I thought always thought that was the bravest thing anyone could ever say. And my cancer patients used to tell me that they submitted to God. And when they did, they suddenly got a feeling that it was in his hands, a true letting go, if you will. And it happened to me, I got the same feeling. And as I let go of controlling my condition, it seemed that my condition flowed in a way that I wouldn't never be responsible for. So when the neurosurgeons told me later, probably part of the reason that you did so well is because you were in great shape. I can't accept that. And the reason I can't accept it is because that moment of submitting to God was so powerful for what it changed in my thinking, in my brain, and the organization of my illness. Like 
the trajectory that I cannot explain it to you. I can only tell you that it was real. So anyway, I woke up on Easter Sunday. They had stabilized me with meds and everything. And they were guarded, but they were somewhat pleased that with my ability, like it seemed like I was more awake, it seemed I was more alert, and they were doing ultrasounds, like it seemed like every 30 minutes on my brain. They were doing numerous tests all the time. And my husband and several friends came over to see me. I was supposed to host a brunch at my house, and I was adamant that my husband and my kids host that brunch. Only now do I see how ridiculous it was, but I really thought that I may die. And if I did, I wanted them to have other people. And I have to explain this to you. The fact that I might die, it was not sad to me. It was not heartbreaking either. It was almost like I wasn't elated. It's just that I was so totally in God's will at that moment. I don't know what else, what other adjective I can put with that. So anyway, to continue the story, I made it through Easter Sunday and my husband was sending out emails and texts to my family and friends. And Monday, I continued to progress, you know, not getting worse not getting better for sure, but I was looking pretty good, except a few people that would come in and say, you look kind of green or you look kind of yellow. And my husband, Ron, said, you know, Mary, I'm not sure because I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to wait here until the blood resolves. And blood was running out of my ears, out of my nose. When when you have a bleed in your brain, because your your brain is so organized that it knows how much fluid it can have, and it had way too much. So you have like three huge valves in the back of your head, and those drain. I also, at this time, I had a brain drain. In other words, they had put a tube in my forehead, and they were draining out excess blood. And they had it taped, so I never really saw myself. But I think when my children came to see me, they were aghast with it. I think that was very difficult for them. I think it was also very difficult for Ron to see. But as far as pain, I had a terrible headache. I had a terrible neck ache. And you just feel nauseated. And you're incredibly weak. Which for me, since I'm so jumpy and usually anxious, probably worked in my favor because they didn't want me out of bed. I couldn't move. And I did had no desire to move or get out of bed. And what happened was I woke up about 2 a.m. Tuesday morning to nurses putting stuff on me. At this time, I had been in the surgical ICU. They moved me out to the floor on Monday. And now I was on the floor going back in. And they were putting like monitors on me. They were waking me up. They were doing all kinds of tests. And they told me, you know, you're not doing well. We called your husband and we're going to move you over to the ICU so we can keep a good eye on you. Apparently my O2 sats had been dropping. So when I was in the surgical ICU, I guess there had been a, an emergency call to these neurosurgeons in Santa Fe. I don't think they were supposed to come back until Thursday, but two of them came back, if I recall that correctly. Anyway, what happened was they decided that they were going to do surgery on my brain. They had been able to locate the aneurysm and they believed I was getting septic. And without this brain surgery, I was not a candidate for them to coil it because it had already burst. And coiling would have been easier because they could have gone through the groin and just not had to open the brain, but they had to open my skull. And during that time, when they were getting me ready and talking to Ron, I saw a white light and it was in the upper right-hand corner of my room. You know, I had been in ICUs. I had been in surgeries as a nurse. I mean, I had worked in the hospital a good portion of my life. 
And this light was not like anything else I had ever seen. It was a bit ethereal. It was a kind of a different color. It was a luminescent, but it also was soft. And as I looked at it, I thought, what is that? Is that a tunnel? Because it almost has like that round, the corrugated side almost, as if it would be an en encapsulated tunnel. And then as I looked at it, I thought, well, I'm not impressed because it's so little. And then all of a sudden, I am moving into it. And it's quite odd the way your body moves into it because you're not lying down flat. You're kind of upright. And your eyes work in a way that I know this sounds strange and even corny, but your eyes can see behind you. I could see and sense that my body, the shell, was on the bed. But what was unbelievable to me is I believe my consciousness, which is very important to me, was with me. I think it was part of my soul because I was able to see what people were wearing. And I could see Ron. Ron was there. He had his head in his hands. He was crying. And he was looking at this document. It was a surgical consent. And all of a sudden, I left that. I didn't care about it. I was so focused on what I was seeing. And I came to this luminescent, like a light pinkish room. And I got the sense that there were no walls. It was, it was just mass. It was an opening, if you will. And I wasn't the only person going through it. It felt like there were other people. And I'm, I'm referring to felt a lot because it doesn't make sense. But you sort of see, you see with your senses too, everything is with you as one. And I felt like I knew that place. Like I, I had felt that place before I had been there. And all of a sudden, I didn't see the exact action, how it happened. God was holding me. And he said, it's not your time. And I was so disappointed because I wanted, I wanted to be there with him. And very different from what I ever expected. The love was not human. And it was comparing it like to human love would be plastic, like a credit card. Whereas this was really deep. And I said, I can't stay, but why not? And I started telling God all of my accolades. I gave free cancer care. I would come up at night when people were dying. I would pray for people. I tried to be a good mother. I tried to be a good wife. I had been a good worker. Every positive thing I could think about myself, which is just so awful and now or arrogant or whatever. I tried to tell him and he said, let me ask you one thing. Have you ever loved anyone the way you've been loved here? And I said, no, that's impossible. I am a human, just to remind God of my humanness. And then the sensation was a closer hold from God and he said, you can do better. And I don't remember leaving that space but I woke up to Ron, like shaking me because he felt like I was unconscious and saying, Mary, we have to make this decision together. Like they have to open your brain and they have to clip this vessel and you might never be the same. You might not be able to run Mary or even walk. And I'm a runner. I was a runner. I was running 50 and a hundred milers. Running was my life. And he said, and your personality might change completely. I need you to tell me it's okay. And I said, it's okay. I'm not going to die anyway. And Ron said, well, I hope not, Mary. I think if you pray, you're close to God, I think you'll be okay. And I said, I just talked to God and it's not my time, Ron. And I woke up after the surgery and I was upset. I was depressed. In fact, I was depressed that I was back here for several months after. And 
what I live with every day now is I live with this incredible memory or whatever's been branded on me. And I ask myself, am I doing enough? Am I standing up for God's goodness? Am I being conscientious with what he gave me? Am I loving others the way he told me to practice loving more? And the answer is always, I'm trying, but it's very difficult. I will tell you one thing. I think I'm a better therapist. And I think I'm a better therapist because I judge less. And I think compassion is the most important gift we give each other. And just get out of this mindset of who's right and who's wrong. I mean, we're all connected and we're all going back there, all of us. And there is a God and he is our source. He is my source. I believe he's yours too, but you have to get there on your own. And I believe he knows each and every one of us. He connects to us in a way that we can't possibly understand. We're very limited with our minds, with our brains, with our bodies here. It's left me with a deep sense of compassion and just the abundance. I, I mean, I can't I can't look at anything without thinking, what can I do? How can I help?